Hello everyone and welcome back to the standard photonics and plasmonics course. So far we've discussed uh, how to actually study plasmons using optical excitations, but uh, we're going to focus on this chapter on the use of uh, electron uh, spectroscopies uh, as a mean to probe plasmonic properties of nanostructures. So electron microscopes are very capable of focusing electron beams on a very small scale, so typically sub-nanometer spots. Um, this is basically because the, the Broad wavelength of electrons is basically below 0.1 angstrom. So this electron beam is basically capable of, uh, of achieving very high spatial resolution and typically below uh, the angstrom limit. Um, so this small diagram uh, basically shows uh, a little bit the comparison between optical microscopy, that's basically the conventional optical far field microscopy, uh, to uh, other type of spectroscopies. Uh, like a near field optical microscopy, uh, cathode luminescence that we're going to be seeing here, and, uh, and EELS that we're going to also see in this chapter. Uh, so, this compares uh, based on the spatial resolution. Uh, so, of course, the, the lower the, the spatial resolution, the better, as, of, as, com as compared to the, to the uh, excitation energy that you're using uh, for your spectroscopy technique. So, whether this is the, the energy of your, uh, of your photons or the energy of your electrons. So for, uh, if you look at for a given energy, let's say you're uh, looking at an excitation of energy of one electron volt, uh, you see that we, for this particular excitation energy, uh, or that we can convert that into wavelength, uh, optical uh, far field microscopy uh, has a certain uh, diffraction limit due to something that are on the order of a few hundred uh, nanometers of resolution. Now uh, we've seen uh, in uh, previous chapters that we can use near fields and evanescent waves to actually decrease and improve this spatial resolution. Uh, so you can go down now to uh, tens of nanometers in wavelength. Uh, so you can really push the limit of the, the imaging resolution uh, when uh, basically just going from far field uh, into near field. Now with the use of electron beams, uh, you can actually go much lower. So we can use cathode luminescence and then uh, EELS that we're gonna discuss uh, in, uh, in a little bit to actually achieve sub nanometer resolution or uh, at least a few nanometers of resolution. So um, electron microscopes are basically the best options uh, in terms of uh, special resolution, but also spectral uh, resolution spectroscopy. And you send uh, high velocity electrons that are basically called swift electrons uh, onto a given specimen. So you're gonna have a lot of different uh, physical processes that are gonna occur simultaneously. Like uh, those electrons that are going just going through the, the specimen be scattered elastically without losing energy. Uh, what can happen also is that uh, as a result of the excitation and the collisions between those energy electrons and the, and the nuclei, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those atoms, you can actually be able to emit X-rays uh, and that's going to give you basically uh, the, the, the spectroscopy techniques uh, known as uh, EDS or EDX. Uh, you can have also the emission of secondary electrons uh, from, the from the specimen. Uh, you can also have uh, OG electrons uh, that can be re resulting from interaction of those electrons with the valence electrons from the, uh, from the, from the, the material you're, you're probing. You can, of course, um, because you have very fast moving uh, charges that are going to be uh, going through this, uh, uh, this interface, you're going to have uh, Cherenkov and transition radiations that can be observed. And basically what we are interested in in this particular chapter are the last two physical processes, which are basically the emission of light as a result of the interaction of these electrons with the, 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 the system, and that's basically known as cathode luminescence. And you have also a fraction of electrons that will basically go through the system, but they will lose a little bit of energy. So there's some kind of inelastic scattering happening. And this is basically what's going to give you the electron energy loss spectroscopy known as EELS. Practically, it's uh, done in uh, either tra uh, transmission electron microscope or in a scanning electron microscope. So you send these uh, high energy electron beams, so typically in a range 50 to 400 kilo electron volt uh, onto a certain specimen. So you really focus uh, this electron beam. Uh, and then if you want to actually measure uh, yields, uh, you're gonna be in a transmission mode. So you're gonna need this transmission uh, capabilities. That's why you do that in the TEM. Uh, so you can do uh, both uh, scanning imaging and also uh, recording the yield spectra uh, for this system. Now, if you basically look in this uh, reflection uh, configuration using parabolic mirrors, you can collect 
the photons that are basically being uh, emitted by the by the structure, collect them, and that's basically going to give you the cathode luminescence signal. You can basically use the SEM to actually collect this cathode luminescence signal, uh, and that's basically much cheaper to do that in the SEM rather than in a TEM. Uh, and typically, this is done at either uh, 80 kilo electron volt, uh, which is basically half of the speed of light. So you can actually look at the electrons with this uh, kinetic energy, calculate uh, what's the De Bruyne wavelength. You see that you are in the picometer, so very small compared to uh, optical uh, excitations. Uh, and you can actually calculate the relativistic factor, uh, this gamma factor. You see that uh, you're starting to have some relativistic effect. Um, and um, yields can also be done uh, typically at uh, 300 kilo electron volts. So you see that uh, basically you are 75% of the speed of light uh, with, of course, much uh, much better spatial resolution, uh, but you are now starting to have very significant uh, relativistic effects. So the electrons that we are looking at are actually relativistic. We can excite plasmon using optical excitation. This we will discuss extensively. Uh, so you just have a, an electromagnetic wave that basically oscillates in time and uh, propagates in space. So when you have these high energy electrons that are focused uh, onto or at least in the vicinity of a plasmonic st structure, those electrons are basically going to have some electromagnetic field associated with them. This is basically what uh, allows you to excite uh, the plasmons in a given plasmonic structure. So the detection of the electron loss is basically giving you different type of information depending on uh, which type of energy range you're interested in. So if you're looking at high energy range, uh, typically uh, above 100 uh, electron volts, you're looking at basically uh, interaction with those high velocity electrons with the core electrons of the materials. But when you look at very low energy, below 10 electron volt, 20 electron volt, you're looking at the plasmonic region. So there's this uh, large peak uh, that shows up at zero uh, electron volt uh, of energy loss. So this is a very intense peak. Uh, this is basically the zero loss peak. These are the electrons that are basically just zooming through or zooming by uh, without losing energy. The part we are interested in are the, basically the low losses. Uh, so the plasmons are typically very close to this zero loss peak. So that's why it's also a challenge to get them. You need basically to filter out all those electrons that are basically uh, not losing energy in order to actually observe those that are losing just a tiny bit, a tiny fraction of energy. So in terms of uh, numbers, remember we are uh, sending electrons that are uh, tens or hundreds of uh, kilo electron volts of energy, and you're looking at the electrons that are losing just a few electron volts. Remember what we discussed in, uh, in chapter one, uh, and then uh, when we discussed again uh, in chapter nine and chapter eight, the surface plasmons have been discovered uh, back in the 50s by Power Swan and Watanabe. Uh, and they used uh, eels measurements to actually look at aluminum and they observe those surface plasmons. So the bulk plasma and the surface plasmons. So I'm going to do a little bit of math here uh, just to show you the, 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 the mathematical formalism behind. But basically, the electromagnetic field, which is associated with a fast moving point charge, is actually regarded as just an evanescent uh, source of radiation. And when this source of radiation is actually moving, uh, those evanescent fields will actually be able to excite the uh, the plasmonic resonance in a given nanostructure. So this allows you to explore uh, regions that are outside of the light cone, where light is just propagating in free space, and that's how you are able to excite uh, SPPs, for instance, uh, that are surface bound modes, and also dark plasmon modes uh, that we're going to discuss. So those dark plasmon modes, like the anti-bonding uh, dipole resonance in a dimer or quadrupoles, uh, without retardation effect are basically not emitting light, but you can actually excite them uh, using eels. So this is uh, basically what explains why uh, those SPPs have been observed uh, back in the 50s, uh, even before uh, Otto and Kretschmann came with their uh, configuration to uh, optically excite uh, SPPs, uh, and this was done in the 60s. The electron charge density can be actually calculated uh, for an electron. From there, so once you have the, the charge density, uh, so basically this is the density of charge. It represents this flow of electrons along uh, the, the electron beam trajectory. Uh, that gives you an electric field. Those electric fields are solutions of Maxwell's equations. And they can be calculated uh, using the green tensors because we have point sources. So we have a, a current density that forms along the trajectory of the electron beam. This is something we've already seen uh, 
quite a few times now, you can calculate the electric field induced by this point charge using the green tensor. From there, uh, what can be done, uh, once you have the electric field, you can actually calculate what's going to be the interaction with this electric field with the nanostructure. So the nanostructure will be excited by the electric field of the, of, of the electrons that are going to induce uh, an electric field. So the induced electric field, if you integrate that in time, project into, onto the, the trajectory of the electron, you can actually calculate how much energy those electrons will actually lose. So this is the total energy loss experienced by the electron interacting with the, with the system. This is also looking at the integral over uh, all the, the frequencies of this quantity, which is the energy loss probability. So this energy loss probability per unit frequency is actually the yield spectrum. So this is actually the yield spectrum. This is calculated directly by integrating over time this uh, induced electric field. So uh, concretely, uh, how does it work? You have this point charge that is moving that has a certain uh, electric field. This electric field will excite the plasmon of the nanostructure, uh, generating an induced electric field. Then this induced electric field, you just uh, measure how much this electric field induced by the plasmonic structure under the excitation by the, uh, by the, the electron is actually along this particular axis. So you just calculate what the value of the electric field induced by the plasmonic structure in response of the, uh, the electron along this axis. And basically that's basically what you, you, you have here. You take the real part, integrate over time those, uh, those coefficients and you calculate the spectrum. So this is just a different form uh, using the green tensor. Uh, you have basically the, the, the ZZ component of the green tensor basically that uh, tells you that you're looking at uh, a point source which is along the Z axis and you're interested in uh, what's the field induced uh, all along the Z axis as well. And you integrate that uh, in space and that's how you get the, the yield spectrum. So I'm not asking you to memorize uh, this complex math. This is just to show you that uh, we use the green tensor formalism to calculate uh, the induced electric field from the plasmonic structure in the presence of uh, these fast moving electrons. As opposed to light, uh, ears can probe any type of plasmonic mode, whether they are bright, dark, or even the bulk plasmon mode. And we will see that in a, in a second that we can actually also probe uh, down to the quantum regime. So if you have a silver nanoparticle, uh, you can actually send the electron beam impacting at those different locations. So these are the different uh, impact parameters. Uh, you can excite the nanoparticle with an electron beam just uh, nearby the surface. In that case, you're going to have uh, one single plasmon resonance. Uh, this single plasmon resonance is the, the dipolar plasmon resonance. This is the, the same dipole resonance what we, we can obtain optically. Uh, and as you move the electron beam uh, inside the nanoparticle, uh, you're going to still excite the plasmon uh, resonance, the SPR, which is a dipole resonance, but you can also excite the bulk plasmon. So this is the bulk plasmon that was observed in the original uh, work by uh, Watanabe, Swan, and, uh, and Powell. Uh, this is the bulk plasmon omega p, which is at uh, for silver 3.78 electron volt. This experiments that have been done at Stanford University uh, in a group of Jen Dion, uh, where they basically looked at uh, single uh, uh, nanoparticles, uh, very small, 11 nanometers in, in size, down to almost 1.5 nanometers in size. And you see that you observe this dipolar resonance, which basically blue shift. Uh, so this is basically just a summary of that. So you have the the diameter of the nanoparticle and you have the energy so you see that when you decrease the size you have this blue shift uh, the dipolar plasma resonance shift toward uh, higher energies or a shorter wavelength and all of a sudden then you have this uh, this opposite direction here uh as if the plasma resonance starts uh, red shifting again when you go to very small sizes and the signature of uh, uh, quantum effects that are actually kicking in because you are very small sizes Another example uh, in the case of, uh, of a dimer, uh, so this is basically the same experiments as has uh, as been done in, in the previous one, but now we have a dimer of uh, silver nanoparticles. If you excite uh, here and close to the, to the end of the nanoparticle by the surface, then you observe certain type of resonances. So you have a bright resonance, you have a dark resonance. So this is the bonding and anti-bonding bipolar resonances that are coming from the plasma hybridization that we discussed extensively in chapter nine. Uh, so the, the dark resonance, which is the antibonding, which is the one at high energy, because of the charge distribution, the, the charge pattern, 
You see that this one will not, uh, will have a zero net type of moment, so this one cannot be excited using light. So you, uh, you will not be able to observe that using optical spectroscopy techniques, but you can actually observe it here using EELS. And similarly, when you excite uh, through the nanoparticle, you have the bulk plasma resonance uh, that also can be, uh, can be seen. So this is just uh, summarize the different configurations when you excite inside or, or, uh, or outside the nanoparticle uh, for a single nanoparticle or uh, at the end inside nanoparticle in the gap. Then you can observe either one, two or three modes uh, depending on the excitation configuration. So you can selectively excite a given set of modes in a, in a nanostructure. Finally, the, the last example I wanted to, to bring here uh, in the case of uh, bow tie uh, antenna. So this is uh, composed of two gold uh, triangular nanoparticles that are placed in this bow tie configuration. So you can excite both at the end or at the center. You can excite anywhere on the structure and then you basically uh, can calculate or measure the yield spectrum accordingly. So if you excite at the, at the end, you see that you have three peaks showing up. If you excite in the gap, you have only one peak. Now uh, we can actually scan uh, the electron beam across the geometry and record an yield spectrum for each, uh, each uh, impact parameter and generating a complete Yields map, so this is a uh, energy loss probability map. This shows the highest lo loss probability for a given energy. Uh, so you see that basically you can generate uh, clear maps that are basically mapping the nature of the plasma mode. So you see that you have strong loss probability from the end when exciting at um, uh, 1.34 electron volts. So this is basically uh, mapping this particular mode. Uh, so this is the, the bonding dipole uh, resonance, which is the bright mode. Uh, then uh, you can have uh, at the center here when you excite uh, very strongly this this small in, in the gap. Uh, this is basically the anti-bonding dipolar resonance. This is the dark mode, similar to the previous um, previous dimer case. Uh, and you can actually even uh, observe in that particular scenario at 2.14 electron volt uh, those uh, those modes that are really uh, with multiple uh, bright spots along the edges of the of the bow tie. And this is basically a uh, qual reporter type of mode. So you can play with those impact parameters for the for the electron beam. You can move away uh, from the end, move away from the gap, break the symmetries. You can see how the mode uh, appears or disappears as a function of the impact parameter. You can map uh, those uh, those modes and determine the nature of the, the plasmonic modes involved in a given nanostructure.